Good evening and welcome. I am Ruth Oliver. I am the secretary of the Friends Board. And we're glad you're here tonight. A lot of you might not know what the Friends are and what the Friends do. Well, I'll start out by telling you what we do. We volunteer at the ground floor, which is the coffee shop on the lower level. And we deliver books to homebound people. We help with book sales. We provide money for the summer reading program. And anytime the library needs something that they don't have the money for, they come and say, do you think the Friends Board could help us out? <laughs> yeah, we help them out. Now, if that isn't enough incentive to become a Friends member, just remember that all of the money that the Friends earn would be added on to your taxes. <laughs> Thank you and enjoy. Thank you. Dr. Zorba Pastor's enthusiasm and contagious laugh has made him a favorite with health conscious public radio listeners for over a decade. The Chicago Native Teams of Wisconsin Public Radio host Tom Clark for a weekly national talk show, Zorba Pastor on Your Health. Zorba also mentors medical students as a clinical professor in the UW Madison Department of Family Medicine, maintains a family medical practice, and travels frequently abroad. His book, The Longevity Code, Your Personal Prescription for a Longer, Sweeter Life, was published in 2001. Dr. Pastor's appearance here tonight is funded by the Friends, and as is his custom for some of his speeches, he is donating his uh, fee tonight to a Tibetan ambulance project that he's going to tell you more about when he comes up here. So please welcome Dr. Zorba Pastor. Can you can you hear me in the back? Yes? Yep. Good. They can hear me, so that's good enough. <laughs> How are you all doing? No snow, isn't that great? No snow. <laughs> no snow. It's funny, I lecture quite a bit, and the first thing I do when I say I'm from Wisconsin, no matter what the time of the year is, I'll go, it's great, it's snowing in Wisconsin. And even if it's the middle of July, <laughs> they believe me. <laughs> They actually believe that it snows here 24 7 it doesn't make a difference that's because you know in the middle of like november or december they show horizontal snow in which case it keeps people from coming into our state and there's sometimes there's an advantage to that <coughs> i don't know if you know but we are number one whether depending on how you look at the stats number one or number two for the number of people who are born in the state who stay in the state and we're number 48 for the number of people who come to the state from other states. <laughs> so basically, we like it here, as, uh, as you used to say. So um, I want to thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. This library, by the way, is magnificent. I think we should give a yeah. applause. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Peggy Hedberg, who uh, is in Madison. I met her at, at a meeting. Uh, about a year ago, and I said, Hedberg, is that the same as the Hedberg Library? And she said, yes, it was my mom who was really interested in my dad, because the first thing you notice in the library is how beautiful it is, how big it is, and how magnificent it is compared to the size of the town. I mean, this is really uh, the type of library that you would see in a town that was much larger and uh, much wealthier. And basically, it really shows community involvement. And, and, and I want to talk a little bit about that, because that has a lot to do uh, with longevity. Uh, but before that, I want to talk about the fact that, that uh, in Wisconsin, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Wisconsin, we are a hefty state. <laughs> a hefty state. We like our beer, and we like our brats. And uh, you have to be careful when you say that. I was recently in Quebec, uh, a good friend of mine who I trained with, uh, was in Quebec and I was talking about that. I went there to talk about physician burnout and I said, in Wisconsin we like our beer and we like our brats, in which case they started laughing, but they were laughing in disproportion to the joke. <laughs> so in my typical American way, I thought, well, I'm not saying it wrong, they just haven't hear heard me. So I said, in Wisconsin we like our beer and we like our brats, at which point they are on the floor laughing. <laughs> 
and they can hardly contain themselves. Now, I don't know French, but I know the word faux pas. And so I said to my friend Jacques, I said, what did I say? And he could hardly contain himself. He said, didn't you say in Wisconsin we like our beer and we like our broads? <laughs> They're French. We think about food, they think about sex. But anyway. <laughs> One of the other things I want to know about the library that actually is good, if you'll notice, in the middle of the library, there's that beautiful section where you can be on the computers. Uh, and it's right out in the open, and there are windows all around. And it's a very, very interesting low-tech way of solving a problem. The computers and the internet are wonderful. And you know, the num health information is the number two reason that people go to the net. Anyone know the number one reason that people go to the net? Come on, gentlemen, pornography is number one. And so, yeah, not in Janesville, I'm sure. But in other places, like in Chicago, uh, what they did was they started restricting information. So look at what they did at the library. Instead of restricting access to information, which I think should be open source, they simply put it out in the open so everyone could look over and see what you're looking at on the net, right? Simple, low-tech way of looking at information. Uh, so if we look at information, what I hope to leave you with are some ideas of how you can live what I call the long, sweet life. Uh, nobody wants to live a long, awful life. Uh, when I did a PBS show a number of years ago called How to Live a Long, Sweet Life, I knew if I said how to live a long, bad life, nobody would pick up the show. Nobody wants to live a bad life. But uh, it's kind of interesting because when I go across the country, many times people say to me, especially young people, and young people means younger than me, uh, often say, I don't want to live to be that old. Yeah. And then you analyze that and you say, what is that about? And you realize that old means, I'm afraid that when I get older, I'm going to end up in a nursing home, I'm going to become disabled, I'm going to lose function, and I'm going to die. Well, I have good news for you. The chances of that happening are less and less every single day, less and less. If we go back to the time when Ronald Reagan was president in the mid-'80s, 35% of the people who are 65 years of age or older were disabled in one or more activity of daily living. They couldn't bathe themselves, or maybe they couldn't go to the grocery store, they couldn't fix their own meals. 35% of the senior citizens were disabled. In 2002, that dropped below 20%. And today, oh, is that, that's my wife, Penny, saying, you can't hear me? If she can't hear me, she's not happy. Let me, uh, you know what we say in our house, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Let me fix the mic. So, but now I, can somebody come in and help me? I, where is the, uh, Linda. Linda? Well, I know the, I know the button, but I can't turn on the light. Oh, there it is. Can somebody, I need some, could you help me, sir? I'm going to have you turn this dial. Here, it's right over here. And I'm going to talk. Just turn that to the, turn that to the right. You see the orange dial? We'll never see him again. <laughs> no, he's going down the black hole of Calcutta. Can you hear me now, Penny? Turn it a little bit to the right. How about now? Can you hear me now? A little bit more to the right. She's not smiling yet. She's got to smile, otherwise I might as well not come home. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Now can you hear me in the back? How about this? No? I think the people in Janesville just don't hear that well. How about this? Is that it? OK, that's as good as it goes, see. What did you do for a living, sir? Uh, worked at GM. See, worked at GM. This man knows how to move machinery and how to, <laughs> how to, how to do those things. So now that, now that you can hear me, I'll try to go like this. But if we look back at disability, the chances that people will be disabled, whoops, I think that's a little bit too I'm sorry. Are you lip syncing this? Are my yeah, lip syncing it? That's right. Now it's locked. <laughs> you know, a sense of humor is an extremely important thing to have whenever you whenever you are speaking live at all. So we have to turn it down. We'll have to turn it down a little bit. So a uh, little bit down to the left. And we'll try to keep that. OK, and if you can't hear me, come up in front. We have some room up here. OK. Can you hear me now, Penn? Good. Hi. Hi. I'm Dr. Zorba. By the way, how many of you listen to public radio? I love it. I can always tell a public radio audience by the way you're dressed. <laughs> you always dress exactly.
exactly the same way. Usually the clothing is not the same as when I speak in Chicago on Michigan Avenue, where they tend to be dressed in $10 million mink coats. It's a very, it's a very different thing. But getting back to the disability, which is the reason that I brought this up, is we are less likely to be disabled today than they were back in the, uh, in the 1980s. So what is actually going on here? Well, what's going on here is that Americans are becoming healthier and healthier and healthier. And the theory right now at the CDC is that two-thirds of all premature death, that's half the people die before the age of 72 and half die out after the age of 72, two-thirds of all premature death can be prevented. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of all premature death can be prevented. How can we prevent it? That's the big issue. But not only do we want to prevent premature death, but we want to make sure that our life is sweet. And the real question is, how do we get from one place to another? What steps can you take today that can make a difference? Now, it's not that life is always sweet. But picture this, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I went back to the University of Illinois to go to medical school. And when I was there, it was the 1970s. And, and there, were, there were parts of medicine that I didn't like. And to give you a, a, a good example, Western medicine had captured childbirth. Western medicine has captured childbirth. And this is what happened when you were a woman delivering at the University of Illinois, and for that matter, all over the state of Wisconsin and other places. Every woman got an IV. Every woman got twilight sleep to put her out of her misery. Scopolamine, Thorazine, which was an antipsychotic, and morphine. I'm going to get rid of this completely and just talk. You know what? I'm, oh, she's not here. <laughs> well, if you can't hear me, then just come on up to the front. I'm not going to use. I'm not going to use the mic. I'll just talk louder. So, pardon me. Sit on the floor with the children. Yeah, I'll sit on the floor. So, every woman would have thorazine. Every woman would have scopolamine and morphine. Women have prophylactic forceps. You put the forceps in and pull the baby out to save the perineum. Nobody ever saw that or thought that was even worse. It was really for a doctor's convenience. Uh, women were given leather straps to keep their hands from soiling the baby. The baby was removed immediately from the mother and put in the bassinet for 24 hours because they were afraid of a strep infection. And I was taught, never let a husband in the delivery room, after all, you are touching his wife. <laughs> by Ralph Wynn, the head of obstetrics, famous guy. I thought, what does he think is going on here? Sex? <laughs> this is a delivery. I may be a child of the 60s, but it's pretty obvious. So that's when Western medicine had captured everything. So I decided that I would uh, take off for, this was a, a winter vacation, and try to get my head together and see what I was going to do. And so I took the Greyhound bus uh, round trip across country. How many of you admit to taking the Greyhound, Greyhound bus across country? <laughs> see, admit, see, there are a few people here who admit it. Uh, $25 round trip anywhere in the country, $50, yoo hoo, unlimited travel for one month on the Greyhound bus. And the bus would stop at 2.30 in the morning, cleaning the bus, everyone would have to get out of the bus, cleaning the bus for you. And you would eat at the Post House Cafe, which had pre-chewed food. <laughs> it was the worst food in the world that you could possibly have, pre-chewed food. And uh, so I went to San Francisco, and I went to the Zen Center. Now, when you sit and you practice Zaza, and you sit facing a wall such as this, uh, trying to calm your mind so that you come up with your true essence. What are your real thoughts? What are your aspirations? And when they would do that, they would call you with a Zen drum. And on that drum was a Zen poem, Attention. Great is the problem of life and death. Time passes swiftly by and opportunity is lost. Each of us should strive to awaken. Awaken. Take heed. Do not squander your life. And I realized that for me to give up medicine would be a squander of my life. I worked hard to get into medical school. Medical school itself was hard. I'd put in a couple of years. And I was just upset with this aspect. Why not go and begin to change things or do things? So my own personal path, I realized, was not just in my office, which I do in Oregon down the road, Wisconsin. Talked to a couple of my former patients here. Uh, but also would be public speaking and trying to make some changes in medical care. And what we really want is a balance between Western medicine on one side, complementary alternative and traditional medicine, and humanism on the other side. 
when you look at burnout, it's very interesting because I just gave a lecture of burnout. There are three things that tend to be associated with job burnout. And I actually think it's more than job burnout. I think it's actually burnout by people. The first thing is dehumanization. You don't see people as people. You don't connect to them with people. It's just one thing after another on a job. And it's not a person at all. There's no interpersonal relationship. The second thing that's often involved is lack of time. In other words, the perception that you just don't have enough time to get what you want done, and you just don't have that time, whether it's real or perceived. And the third thing is lack of balance. And these things tend to lead to burnout, which make your life simply awful. <clears throat> and as I said, when I gave this lecture to physicians about burnout, and I realized it's not only physicians, it's other people who work, there's also such a thing as retirement burnout. You can be retired and feel that you have time constraints, there's nothing personal that you're doing, and you have no balance between the things that you want to have. And these balance issues are keenly important. Now, if you think that balance is new, it's not. If you look at the Greeks, the cult of Asclepius, Asclepius was the god of health and wellness. Uh, and he had two daughters, and they fought all the time. The Greeks were wonderful for mythology because the way they worked things out was they, they worked things out between people that were fighting and myths to try to develop an idea of how to make changes. And these two daughters fight. He was the god of health. One daughter was Panacea. Panacea was god of medicine. And they didn't even have Lipitor in those days. <laughs> Nor did they have a Blue Cross and Blue Shield or a Dean Care drug plan. But that was the god of medicine, or Medicare Part D, which you know what that is. Nor did they have a donut hole. But anyway, that was Panacea. The other daughter was Hygienia, from which we get the word hygiene. And hygiene actually means not just cleanliness. It means eating properly and exercising. So the Greeks saw the balance there. And that's what you need, too. You need a balance between those two aspects of your life. You have wellness and what you can do on wellness on one side, and where do you put in Western medicine? And remember, the CDC data now shows that two-thirds of all deaths are preventable before the age of 72. So we have a lot of work to do, and we can do it. So how do we get to there? Well, you get to there by what I think of looking at the five spheres of life that affect you. And I'm going to go into these a little bit. The physical sphere, the mental sphere, the family and social sphere, the spiritual sphere, and the material sphere. And I'm going to touch on these a little bit. When I wrote my book, The Longevity Code, uh, a number of years ago, I really started developing this at a, at a concept, as a concept. And uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be traveling to Buffalo, New York, because uh, they produced my uh, PBS show. And I'm going to talk to them about another PBS show that I hope is going, we're going to produce sometime over this next year that looks at these a little, in a little bit more detail of these five spheres. So let's talk about the physical sphere. Now in the state of Wisconsin, you can't talk about the physical sphere unless you talk about food. And the issue with food is we've never paid attention to that most important philosopher, Miss Piggy, who once said, never eat more than you can lift. <laughs> and she was a pig. She'd be shunned today because she's swine, but she was a pig. <laughs> she was a pig. So let's look at food. Well, when Reagan was president versus now, the average fast food meal is 250 calories more than it was in the 1980s. Culver's, I know none of you ever go to Culver's. I tell my patients, I say Culver's, 99% of them say, I never go, I never eat fast food. Even when they weigh 350 pounds, I never eat fast food. <laughs> I was with a very good, good, nice patient of my mind the other day, last week. He weighs about 350, 400. And I said, how do you eat? He said, Doc, I eat like a bird. I eat like a bird. I said, what do you eat? I got a little piece of dry toast in the morning. I have a little glass of orange juice. Uh-huh. And at lunch, I have a salad. Uh-huh. What about dinner? I got a little card of beef, a little bit of that. I have a little juice and maybe a piece of pizza. That's all I eat. I said, OK. The other day when you watched the Minnesota Vikings and the Green Bay Packers play, and I know you love Black Favre, and I don't know what side you were on, what did you have to eat? And he said, no, no, Doc, you don't understand. I said, no, mono on mono. We're in the room alone. Tell me. Here's what he ate. He had eight brats. Oh. He had 12 beers. Oh. He had two liters of Coke and two bags of Cheetos. Oh. That almost made me lose myself right there, just the thought of it. <laughs> and he thought he ate like a bird, and that was different. But the issue is food. Now, what's the most caloric meal at Subway? The most caloric sandwich is? The tuna salad sandwich. Why? Mayo. 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 
We all need, everyone here needs about 2,000 calories a day. If you go to Culver's and you get the chicken dinner, it's 1,660 calories. And that does not include the milkshake. Does not include the milkshake. It used to be the fries at McDonald's accompanied the meal. Now the fries are as much as the Big Mac. A Big Mac is 550 calories. A large fry is 575 calories. That's where you get it. Now, if you drop 300 calories a day from your meal, which is a small burger at McDonald's, 250 to 300 calories, you will drop about 10 to 15 pounds at the end of the year. That's all it is. It's a small change. It's not a big step. It's not the Atkins diet. By the way, old fat Dr. Atkins, he weighed 235 pounds <laughs> when he died and died of a heart attack, no matter what his widow say, said. She said he didn't die of a heart attack because she was making big bucks doing the Atkins food and the candy bars. But he died of a heart attack. So if you look at food, what you want to look at portion control. Go down to a, any sort of an antique store and look at those little white plates. They were dinner plates. They were not dessert plates. In Wisconsin, we call them dessert plates because that's our dinner is dessert. So look at your food. What else should you do in your food? Your food should be color coordinated. Now, I don't just mean fiesta wear, which, by the way, is on sale at the Boston store. <laughs> We've got fiesta wear. We haven't had a chip in it in five years. The, it's good. The new fiesta wear is great. The old stuff was lead paint. Be careful with that. But the new stuff is great. But color coordinating food, and why is that? Well, it turns out that color and micronutrients go hand in hand. Vitamins, minerals, carotenoids, flavonoids, phytochemicals follow color. The brighter the color, the more minerals and vitamins are in the food. So dark leafy vegetables are better. Spinach is better than iceberg lettuce. There's hardly anything in iceberg lettuce compared to spinach, right? If you look at carrots, there's a lot in carrots. Now, what you want to do is have a variety of colorful foods on your plate because they're very, they're very important and they follow things. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the issues here. Remember beta carotene? Remember how big it was, beta carotene in this, beta carotene in that? The FDA was very interested in the CDC in whether or not beta carotene was useful because we know that people eat a lot of broccoli and carrots, eat, have a lot of beta carotene, have fewer heart attacks, stroke, and cancer. So they did a huge study with beta carotene supplementation called the carrot, C-A-R-E-T-1, and carrot 2, and here's what they found. They found that people who smoke cigarettes who took beta carotene had a 25% higher cancer rate and death rate than people who did not take beta carotene. It's very clear that it is not just the beta carotene, but something else within the beta carotene containing vegetables. Turns out there are 17 different kinds of beta carotene in, in a carrot. Wow. So mother nature was right. It's the vegetable that counts. Next week, you're going to see an article. I'm going to tell you about an article. It'll come out in JAMA on Monday at 3 o'clock, so it'll hit the news Monday or Tuesday morning, and it's going to be on folic acid supplementation because I get the public relations about a week before it actually comes out. Folic acid is now put in white bread. It's now put in a lot of supplements. It's put in cereals. It's very important for a number of reasons because it appears to be important to, have, to prevent certain birth defects in children. And, and it turns out that folic acid may be important for heart attack and stroke. But they found out that smokers who take folic acid combination have 20 to 25 percent higher rate of cancer when they have folic acid. This is going to come out this next week. So look in the newspapers, look in the newspapers and read the news and you'll see that coming out. The reason that I think that this is critical is that food is the key. Spend your money in the grocery store, do not spend your money in the drugstore. So what do you need for supplements? Let's jump over to supplements for a minute. Everyone needs a multivitamin with minerals. How many of you take a multivitamin? Should be 100%. Why? Folic acid, beta, uh, vitamin B12 is in there. I think we still need a minimal amount of folic acid. We don't need a milligram, but we need 0.4, which is in your multivitamin. What should you buy? It should say multivitamins with minerals, USP. That means it meets the US pharmacopoeia standards and it dissolves properly. Now let me tell you what this means. If you go to Walgreens and you buy Walgreens A to Z, it comes in a tablet. The tablet is hard milled so it's easy to swallow. When it goes through your body, the vitamins leach out of the tablet, but sometimes the skeleton of the tablet remains in your stool. 
If you're of German descent, you tend to look at the stool because your mother has taught you that. Now, I learned this from a friend of mine who is German who told me this. We were having a wonderful conversation with <laughs> Maillard. I don't know how this came up, but poop came up somehow in the conversation. <laughs> And he told me that German mothers always teach their children to look at their poop before they flush, whereas English mothers teach them to turn down the toilet before they flush so they don't look at their poop. <laughs> so if you're of English descent and you don't look at your poop, that's not the state of Wisconsin, you don't notice it. But I mention this because there are people who make money out of colloidal minerals, they call it. $25 to $35 a month. They'll say it's a liquid vitamin and this will dissolve better. The answer is no, it doesn't. It doesn't dissolve better. Spend that $25 in the grocery store. So color coordinate the plate, eat the food in a plentiful way, and eat a more Mediterranean diet. Now, what is a Mediterranean diet? First of all, you all have internet connection. If you don't, you should get it. It's important. It's fabulous. Google the word Mediterranean diet. Google the word Mediterranean pyramid. I have trouble spelling the word Mediterranean, but on Google, it'll spell it for you. <laughs> kind of neat, I like that. <laughs> My Aunt Myrtle still said I should learn how to spell, but I never did. But anyway, that's another story. But Mediterranean diet is the way we should eat. At the bottom of the pyramid, it shows daily exercise. That's the most important thing when we think of food. So what's the best exercise? Walking, Walking is great. It's anything you will do. 10,000 steps a day. What does the average person in Wisconsin get every day? Guess. 2,000. The average person in Wisconsin gets 2,000. The average person in America gets 2,000. We should get 10,000 steps a day. We are a nation of slugs. We don't even get out of our car when we go to McDonald's. We go through the drive-thru. We don't even want to get out of our car. We have become a nation of eaters and not a nation of exercisers. So everyone should get a pedometer. If you've got one at home, dust it off, put it on your belt, and see how much you're really walking. Because exercise is at the bottom. The next step are fruits and vegetables, plentiful, whole grains. Anytime you can have a whole grain, it's important. After that, we have low-fat dairy products, then fish and poultry, and at the top, meats and sweets. Meats and sweets. In other words, less beef, less sweet stuff. That's at the top of the pyramid. And then they sit down and they eat. Now, this is some interesting facts that came out in an article uh, uh, two months ago. There were two articles on the Mediterranean diet that I think are critical. One was an article looking at Spain, and they looked at people in Spain who live along the Mediterranean Sea, who follow the Mediterranean sort of diet, and those who become more industrialized. The Mediterranean Sea is Spain, Italy, Portugal, you know, wonderful areas. It's warm, it's sunny, the people there have a wonderful time, they don't have snow. It sounds delightful, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, but they have problems just like we do. And some people follow the diet, some do not. The people who ate a more Mediterranean diet appeared to have 30% less depression than the people who ate a more industrialized diet that we do more of a diet that was not plentiful in fruits and vegetables. So it's clear that the food you eat can also affect your mental state. It's also part of it. So your food should be color coordinated, and you should also sit down and eat with your friends. Uh, I had a Tibetan doctor, a Dr. Satan. I've been uh, very much involved in Tibetan causes for many years. I'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, and I brought him here to get some continuing medical education at the university. And I said, what do you think about Wisconsin? And he said, I love the state, but you people eat everywhere. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, this is in the office. He said, look over there. They're snacking on candy. I said, you're right. He said, no matter where I go, you're eating. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought we eat everywhere but the toilet. <laughs> and a lot of us bring coffee into the bathroom, so we do eat everywhere. <laughs> now, another aside, by the way, in these cultural differences, a good friend of mine, Stuart Prager, is a physicist in Madison. And they had a physicist who came to visit them from, uh, from uh, Germany. And he was there for three months. He loved Madison. They had a wonderful dinner for him. And they asked him, what did you like about Madison and Wisconsin? And he said, I, I like the people. I like the food. I like everything about here. But your, but your city is infested with prostitutes. Your city is infested with prostitutes. I live in Madison. I don't know where the prostitutes are. <laughs> Their mouth dropped and said, what do you mean? And then when they explained it, they, you know, they now realized what was going on. He thought that all the women 
standing outside of the buildings in cold weather, smoking cigarettes were prostitutes. <laughs> and he never asked. <laughs> Luckily, he never went up to the prostitutes to ask them. <laughs> so color coordinate your food. Daily exercise, daily exercise every single day. And sleep, we're sleep deprived. We know that children who don't sleep enough don't do as well in school. It should be seven, eight hours, seven, eight hours a night of sleep. You should have that in bed. Do not go to sleep with the TV on. It activates the brain and it decreases the melatonin, the natural melatonin that helps you sleep. If you want to go to sleep, read a book. And if you don't like reading a book because you're reading too much, get a boring book. Read the newspaper, pick out something else. Read the tax journal, pick out something you don't like. But do not go to sleep if you're having trouble with the TV on. It disturbs sleep. Your bed should be comfortable, it should be warm enough, and not too warm and not too cold. If you Google the word sleep hygiene, you'll get a whole bunch of information about how to sleep well. Alcohol disturbs sleep. Caffeine after 12 o'clock for some people disturbs sleep. Not eating properly or eating too late at night, we get 40% of our calories in Wisconsin after 6 o'clock at night. I call it the Gray's time. You call it prime time, I call it the Gray's time. So. Supplements. We talked about multivitamins with minerals. What else? Aspirin every day. Every single day. Why? Heart attack prevention, stroke prevention decreases colon polyps by 50%. We do not know if it decreases colon cancer by 50%. There's a big study going on. It won't be out for three years. <clears throat> when that study goes on, we'll know. But I recommend an aspirin tablet every day. There's data that aspirin may also prevent breast cancer. That will be out also in about two years. So that, vitamin D, 1,000 units a day. You don't get enough in a multivitamin. Why? We don't get enough sun. Now the vitamin D in dairy products is good enough to prevent rickets in children. We don't see rickets anymore because of Babcock, because of the great work at the University of Wisconsin, irradiating milk and putting vitamin D milk, important work that was done in 1900. But the data on vitamin D is very interesting. The study came out last year in Nebraska. And this was an osteoporosis study, a third of the women got calcium, a third of the women calcium and D, and a third of the women usual care, no supplement at all. Followed for four years to see who broke their hips, who did not, who had osteoporosis. They did densitometry studies. The women on calcium and D did a little better, not that much better, just a tad better in terms of hip fractures, not significant. But what they found was there was 50% less cancer in the vitamin D group. Then they went and they looked at the data even further and they saw women who had uh, vitamin D on year two, three, and four of the study had 80% less cancer. Whole bunch of research that went on, and the present data shows low vitamin D levels make you more likely, 20 to 30% more likely, to have cancers of all sorts. Now, what we don't know is if people who have low vitamin D levels are different. Are they outside more? Probably not, because you don't get much vitamin D in the winter, because you don't go outside with very little clothes on in Wisconsin in the winter. <laughs> Some people metabolize D differently than others. There are studies going on with vitamin D supplementation. They take a long time. They take five to seven years before there are enough cancer rates to know whether or not it makes a difference. But until that time, you need 1,000 units of D and you've got to buy it separately. It is usually not in a multivitamin. So multivitamin, aspirin, vitamin D, and the fourth wing is booze, alcohol, wine, beer. So where's the alcohol? Why doesn't the American Heart Association talk about alcohol? The reason is there are a bunch of East Coast puritanical snobs. <laughs> Anything that makes us feel good, they don't think can be good for us. Now, what we have to do, what we have to do is immediately take the 15% of the people who have an alcohol drug problem and say, this advice is not for you. Now, I can't tell you, but every single week, I have somebody who calls up my radio and says, Dr. Pastor, I'm an alcoholic. Should I have a drink every week, every day, every day? And the answer is no, open parenthesis, dummy, close parenthesis. <laughs> so you have to remove the 15 or 20 percent of the people who cannot tolerate alcohol. And the data is very strong. One drink a day for women, one to two drinks a day for men. Not to be taken, that's roughly seven to 14 drinks, not to be taken on Saturday night on an empty stomach. <laughs> Binge drinking is not what it is. It's having the alcohol with your meals. Why is that? We don't know if it affects platelets, which is clotting. We don't know if it's relaxation. We don't know if those people are different. But it is any form of alcohol. The French would like us to think it's red wine. 
so would the Californians, but it's beer. Beer also seems to be there. Or it's a shot of Jack Daniels. Now, that's not quite as romantic. I'm having my shot of Jack to protect my heart as a glass of red wine. But it turns out it's alcohol with food that seems to be protective. So those are supplements. That's our physical sphere. Uh, let's jump over to the mental sphere. What's in the mental sphere? The mental sphere has the number one booster. The number one longevity booster is lifelong learning. Lifelong learning. All of you are engaged in this right now. And I, and I kid you not. You're all engaged in this now. Lifelong learning means the ability to take information, process it, begin to learn, and make decisions. And I want to give you a, a very interesting thing having to do with health literacy. In the country, roughly one third of the people are health illiterate. And I'll explain just what that is. Roughly 20% are marginal, and roughly half the people are health literate. So I'm going to give you an example of a question given to 4,000 people, and roughly one third of the people could not answer this question. Okay? You were given one and a half minutes to answer this question with an interviewer in front of you, and it was multiple choice. Okay, so it was really simple. It was a prescription bottle, and you looked at the bottle, and it said, take one tablet three times a day. Three. Three times a day. It says take one hour before meals or two hours after meals. One hour before meals, two hours after meals. Okay? You are going to take it in the morning when you get up, last thing at night before you go to sleep. You're eating lunch from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. One hour before meals, two hours after meals. You're given multiple choice. So you can take that pill 12 minus 1 at 11 o'clock, or 1 o'clock plus 2, 3 o'clock. That's one of the answers. The other answers are all, all over the place. One third of those people could not answer that question in a minute and a half. Follow those folks for five years, and they are 50% more likely to be dead. If they're a diabetic, they're 50% more likely to die of a heart attack. If they have COPD, chronic lung disease, they're 50% more likely to die, and so on. Health literacy is a leading cause of death in America. It's extremely important to take information, be able to process it, and make a decision for yourself. Do I need this drug? Do I need a catheterization? What should I do? I've read something in the newspaper. Sift and winnow. Those are all the things that are important, and that's why you're here. You're not just here to me to talk about things. I'm not an entertainer. I'm talking to you about health, and you care about health, and this will actually prolong your life and make it sweeter. Within that mental sphere, besides that, are what I call longevity busters. The biggest buster is depression. Depression affects 5 to 7% of the population at any time. Depression causes heart attacks and strokes. And let me repeat that. Major depression kills you as much as a cholesterol over 300. Where is the data? The data comes especially from people who have had a heart attack. If you have a heart attack and you've had major depression, the chances you will have another heart attack within one year are three times greater than if you're not depressed. If you've had a stroke, three times more likely to have a stroke. If you have bypass surgery, three times more likely to clog the bypass. If you've had a stent, three times more likely to clog the stent. Major depression. But there's a cousin of depression that's even worse, and that is anger. Here's the study in the journal Circulation. Three groups of people. People who never get angry. They don't live in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> the study took place in Michigan. They don't live in Wisconsin. Group number two. People get angry and they say, I'm angry, I'm upset, I want to work it out. Group number three, they are the screamers. They are the ranters. They are the people who yell. They turn red in the face and their jugular vein stands out and they huff and they puff. Steam comes out of their ears and you cannot say a word because they are in anger land. Follow these people for five to seven years and they have six to seven times the stroke rate. Six to seven times the stroke rate. So it's very clear that getting up and jumping up and ranting and raving and screaming in anger is different than jumping up and ranting and raving and screaming because a touchdown was thrown for the Packers. <laughs> totally different. But if you look at them on videotape and you don't hear them, they may look the same. In one case, in one case, it's your endorphins that are flowing that are making you feel good. It gives you resilience and joy and happiness. And in the other case, you feel washed out and bad. We've all lost our temper at one time or another, even if we've never lost our temper. And it never makes us feel good. And it turns out that it's bad for our hearts. And I'll explain why scientifically. And bad for the blood vessels in our hearts. So that's in our mental sphere. What else is in our mental sphere? Joy and happiness. Learned optimism. Can you learn to be optimistic? 
yes, we can all learn to be more optimistic. I was recently doing uh, some research because I think optimism is part of the reason that some people take action and some people don't. And it was interesting to look at age-related optimism. When people are younger, things that often make them optimism, uh, optimistic are new and exciting things to do, challenges to take, new experiences to have. That often occurs, those are, if you look at people 30 years in age and under, those are things that tend to make them optimistic. As we get older in the life space, those are not the things. The things that make us optimistic are friends and family and emotional relationships with other people. Those are things that nurture our optimism. And one theory that I have that I think holds up that why women live longer than men is that women are often more optimistic because they nourish their social sphere. They nourish their friends and family. Men often uh, have friends around their work, friends around athleticism. So when they quit their job and they stop playing their sport, they often lose their friends and they don't replenish them. Whereas women are much more involved in friends and family, which is why the social sphere is so crucial. The social sphere, the third sphere, is very important. Now the social sphere is fascinating throughout the life space. Uh, for young people, especially for young men, young men suffer from a potentially terminal disease that I call testosterone <laughs> dementia. <laughs> <laughs> where testosterone is surging through their bodies, making them do wild and crazy things. And when they have a significant relationship with someone else, Another human being, they tend to buckle up their seatbelt, they don't smoke cigarettes as much, they drink less alcohol, and they start to take care of their health. That's in the young age. But for older people, it's fascinating stuff. The, a fascinating study that came out in the Archives of Internal Medicine looked at people with stage four congestive heart failure. Now, congestive heart failure comes from when you have numerous heart attacks and your heart eventually becomes floppier and floppier and floppier and can't keep up with its needs. That's congestive heart failure. It's the number one cause of death in America today because we're saving people from heart attacks, but they get more heart failure. Stage four is one, two, three steps, and I'm short of breath. Short of breath. When you get stage four failure, you've got a very high chance you're going to be dead within a few months. In other words, it's, it's the end of the life for those people. They looked at people who live with someone else versus people who don't live with someone else. Okay, These are senior citizens. Now, I mention it because a lot of people who are senior citizens live with someone else, and they're not married. Now, my Aunt Shirley was one of these people. My <laughs> Uncle Al died a number of years ago. My Aunt Shirley is a wonderful person, recently passed away. And when I lived with my wife, Penny, my Aunt Shirley never lost a chance to tell my mother how awful it was I lived with my wife before we got married. We were living together for a year, and every time she was on the phone with my mother, Rhoda, she said, Rhoda, why are they living together? They ought to get married. And my mother, taking my side, said, oh, Shirley, I've got words for you. We're just not going to discuss it. <laughs> so when my Aunt Shirley moved in with Jack and didn't get married, oh. I never lost a chance. My mother already passed away to tell my Aunt Shirley what I really thought about that. <laughs> and I said, Aunt Shirley, think about the terrible things you're showing the young people in our family. <laughs> I told her this on the phone. You are giving them a terrible you know, thing to follow. And uh, you, know, you should get married to them. And she said, you don't understand social security. <laughs> if we get married, we'll get more money. At which point I said to her, and Shirley, I don't think it's the checks, I think it's the sex. <laughs> At which point she went click and hung up. <laughs> she didn't have a cell phone, she had a landline when you could really make a statement when you were <laughs> But getting back to, to the issues of, these, of this particular study, it looked at people with class 4 congestive heart failure. Okay, with what they found, two things. Number one, People who live with another person tended to live six to nine months longer, up to a year longer, than people who lived alone. Very interesting. That's not what was interesting. What was interesting was they lived six to nine months longer whether they loved the person or hated the person <laughs> they were living with. It didn't seem to matter. So either they live longer because, honey, I want to be with you, or they live longer, honey, I'm going to live longer in spite of you. <laughs> I am serious. It did not seem to make a difference. There's something about being with other human beings that matter, even if you hate them. They still give you value. They still give you value. So I think that social relationship is very important. So you have physical, you have mental, you have family and social. What's in the spiritual aspect? Well, the spiritual aspect may be the religious practice you were born with. 
Um, I was giving an in-service at the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we were doing three sessions. A young woman came up to me and she said, I don't relate to the church that I went to with my mom. We, this was in a group format. And we said, why don't you go to different churches? Four months later, after a few things, she went to 10 churches and found a church she could relate to. It might be a different religious practice that you have. It might be a total different way. I'm very interested in Buddhism and Zen Buddhism. That was important to me. It's art, it's music, it's time with Mother Nature, which I call biophilia, the desire to be with time with Mother Nature. We love Mother Nature. We even wear motifs of it. On the whole, plants more than animals are a motif. You're wearing a wonderful sweater with leaves on it. If you were wearing leopard skin, we'd have a completely different view of you right now. <laughs> I knew I could trust you with that. But seriously, it's biophilia. It's the desire to be with Mother Nature. These are things that, that we like. What we loved about Wisconsin today, it was it's Indian summer. We could go outside. We can enjoy the wonderful weather before winter comes because we know, you know we don't have very many days. And that first day of spring when it's warm, we love it. We all go outside in as little clothing as we can <laughs> to enjoy the weather because we've just been all bundled up. So what else is in the spiritual sphere? Well, there are a few things. There are a few things that are on. There, is, there are the arts and the act of compassion. Um, I've been very involved with Tibetan causes for many years. I've met the Dalai Lama a number of times. My wife and I have been involved uh, with bringing uh, the Dalai Lama uh, to Madison. We are very helpful with a number of his visits. If he ever comes and speaks there, go hear him. It's wonderful to speak. And he talks about, even if you are the most selfish person in the world, if you are wise, you'll understand that when you do something for someone else, you get benefit too. You get benefit too. And it's these small random acts of compassion that are also important. It's not just the money that you give. And that's very important. $5 here, $10 there, supporting things that you believe in. It doesn't have to be a lot, volunteerism. But it's the mini stuff that you do. I'll give you a good example. Good example is the other day on a Sunday, I went to the Quick Trip in Oregon. And I love donuts. I mean, I love donuts. But I limit myself to a donut a week. It's OK. It's OK. You know, one donut a week is fine, chocolate covered or glazed, whatever I want to <laughs> So uh, in the Mini Mart, which is the Quick Trip, uh, this woman was obviously very busy. It was morning. Everyone was busy. And I said, hi, how are you? And she said, I'm fine. She's busy doing the change. You know. Well, it's there. And I said, no, how are you today? How are things going? And she looked up. She had a smile on her face and a twinkle in her eye. And she said, it's OK. I'm OK today. It's kind of nice outside. And we had a minute interaction. It wasn't a minute. It was a 10-second interaction. And she smiled when I left. And I smiled when I left. And I realized, that's it. It's right there. It's that connectiveness. And it's not spent for that special day. I have four wonderful children. They're perfect. Never gave us a stitch of trouble. Never gave us a stitch of trouble. But the thing that bound us together at the family were the soccer games and were the volleyball games that we might go to and other things. It wasn't just the family trips. We did two-week family trips and traveled across the country in our car. But it was really the mini stuff that we engaged in. It's the mini activities of compassion that lead you and nourish your spiritual spirit. So the final sphere is material, physical, mental, family, and social, spiritual. The material sphere is very interesting. I, I want to give you a perspective. I want you all to hold out your hand. I want you to picture that your wallet is in your hand, OK? Wallet is in your hand. It's filled with money. You got a wallet in your hand. It's filled with money. You live in Chicago. It's filled with money. Big money in your wallet. <laughs> hold your hand like this, and I want you to take a deep breath, OK? Which is more important? Your breath. Exactly. Yeah, what do we often pay more attention to? We often think about the material sphere. So we've got to put it into perspective. Do we need a certain amount? Yes. Pay off debt. Make sure you have retirement. Pay for the bills that are there. Have a little bit extra. Very, very important. But put it into perspective and then figure out what to do with the excess that you have if you have any excess. It might be a dollar. It might be $10. It might be more than that. It's very, very interesting. A recent a study that came out of England that's been ongoing, like our Framingham study called the Whitehall study, looked at civil servants. They've been following them now for 50 years. They have four classes of civil servants. They're in England, so they all have national health insurance. They all have equal access to health care, OK? Equal access. Group number one were the bureau chiefs. Number two were the technical. Number three were the clerical. Number four were the worker bees. They follow these people, and what they found is that an obese hypertensive diabetic bureau chief lives longer than an obese hypertensive diabetic janitor. <laughs> what does this mean? 
when you look at it. It very, very, and it follows a linear relationship just like high blood pressure and just like cholesterol. It means when you mine the data that job satisfaction plays a role. It's not just that the bureau chiefs have job satisfaction because some do and some don't. But if you're in charge of what you're doing and you get kudos, you're more likely to get job satisfaction. But that's not always the case because there are a number of people who are in other job categories who get lots of job satisfaction too. So within, <coughs> within the material sphere, <coughs> what's important is to look at job satisfaction for the job that you're doing and retirement satisfaction for the volunteer jobs that you're doing or the money that you're spending, to put that into perspective. And there are other things in the material sphere that are important. How many of you have carbon monoxide monitors in your house? <coughs> okay. How many of you have heat in your house? <laughs> you all have heat. Carbon monoxide kills. In Wisconsin, five to 10 people this year will die of carbon monoxide. It is a preventable disease. You plug it in, yes, you have to pay $25 one time for one that lasts. You plug it in and it lasts as long as you have electricity. Electricity goes off, the furnace doesn't go on anyway. Doesn't make any difference. So that's part of it, making sure you don't have throw rugs around the house. Because throw rugs, if you're a senior citizen, are bad. Make sure your house is properly lit. Changing the fluorescent bulbs so you're not spending as much money on electricity. A whole bunch of things within the material sphere that we often neglect. Why? Because we're stuck on numbers in America. What's my blood pressure? What's my cholesterol? What are my numbers? Uh, what do I have in terms of my diabetes? They're important. They're just not the beginning and end. Remember, the balance between hygiene on one side and panacea on the other side, between Western medicine on the other side, and the other side complement your alternative and humanism on that other side. That's where you get your balance. That's where it fits. So where's the science behind this? Well, a few things I want to correct. Depression does not cause cancer, period, period. There is tremendous data that shows that. Depression does not cause cancer. Now, depression may lead you to bad habits, such as smoking cigarettes. That causes cancer. Cancer, we know, is mostly in the environment and not in the genes. I'll give you the, uh, I can prove it to you in less than one minute, but first I have to give you the setup. In Scandinavia, in, ha in uh, Finland, in Denmark, in Norway, in Sweden, they have one HMO. And it's not Dean Care. They have one HMO. It's called the federal government. And they don't have the same HIPAA regulations as we have. HIPAA, you know that thing you get from your doctor? How many of you have read that from start to finish? <laughs> I always like to identify the obsessive compulsives in the audience, and none of you are obsessive compulsives. By the way, those are the people in front of you at the rental counter, and they want to read the whole thing in the fine print. <laughs> but if you look at that, they are able to look at identical twins. They have 100,000 sets of identical twins they've followed now for about four decades. Identical twins have the same genetic code, OK? One egg, two people, same genetic code. That's the setup. Here it is. If one twin gets breast cancer, the chances the other twin will get breast cancer are 25%. Therefore, 75% is environmental. If one twin gets colon cancer, the chances the other twin will get colon cancer happens to be 20%. Therefore, 80% is environmental. And if one twin gets lung cancer, the number one cancer killer in the US, in Wisconsin, and worldwide, the chances the other twin will get lung cancer is totally dependent on tobacco. Totally dependent on tobacco. And thank you, legislature, we will finally have a tobacco-free environment in Wisconsin in public places and cut down on tobacco for all of us. So that's where it is. It's clear that that cancer is in the environment. We just don't know what a lot of it is. We know what it is with lung cancer, but not for the other cancers. Now, what about heart attacks and stroke? We have reduced heart attacks by 60% in the last three decades. 60% premature heart attacks, tremendous. We reduced stroke by 70%, outrageous, 70%. Why? Because of the adequate treatment of hypertension, good medications for hypertension and cholesterol. But we can still only predict 50% of all premature heart attacks, those are heart attacks, before the age of 72. Only 50%. When you look at the data, the present theory is that this is to due to an exaggerated flight or fright response. Flight or fright is you get adrenaline surging through your body, and it was to get you out of here. Somebody was chasing you, and you were to run because you were being attacked. That's what it was till a couple hundred years ago, flight or fright. So picture yourself. You're in a job. You don't like your job. You don't, you're having trouble with your family. You're worried all the time. Adrenaline surges through your body. What does that do? Increases respiration, that's neutral. 
Increases pulse suddenly, usually to over 100. Bad for your heart. Increases blood pressure suddenly, especially systolic blood pressure, to 180 to 200. Bad for your heart, bad for the blood vessels of your heart and your brain. What else does it do? It turns out that it makes your blood more likely to clot. That's why we take aspirin, so our blood shouldn't clot. Remember, somebody's going to attack you, cut you. You don't want, you want to make sure you clot. Not in our modern age, but that's what it is. And finally, it is arrhythmogenic. It makes your heart more likely to go into ventricular fibrillation. That's what the shock is for when the EMT comes to your house, hopefully not for you. So let's look back. You hate your job, you hate your family, you don't have any friends, you live alone, you have monetary problems, you have more adrenaline surging through your body, you're more likely to have a heart attack and stroke. But now you've got a spiritual path, you've got friends and family, a good friend you can call at 4 o'clock in the morning, you're happy with your job, life is okay, you have a spiritual path. It gives you reserve. It's very clear it's not the numbers. It's the mental, it's the family and friends, it's the spiritual and the material sphere, along with the physical sphere on that part, that gives you the long, sweet life. But to really find this, what you have to do, I think, is not just sift and winnow, like we say in Wisconsin, to learn things, but you have to find longevity mentors. Now, mentors are very interesting. There are people that inspire us, and there are our mentors. People who inspire us, we may read about. I've read three books on Lincoln. I find him very, very inspiring. He's incredible. There are more books written by Lincoln than anybody else, anybody else practically in the world. Incredible number of books written by Lincoln, very inspiring. But people inspire us and children inspire us. Young children inspire us. Little kids with a bright-eyed and bushy tail who think they can solve the world and power everything, they are inspiring. They're very interesting. They're not necessarily mentoring. Uh, my youngest daughter, Vanessa, I'll never forget it. I was going on a picnic with her. She was uh, eight years old, nine years old, and <clears throat> came home. I promised her I was going to go on a picnic, and I was hairy. I don't remember why I was hairy, but I was having issues or problems, and I got in the car, and I was all hairy, and we went over to our park, which was just down the block in the car, but I, I brought the picnic basket, and she got out of the car, and she smiled at me, and she said, you know, Daddy, there's no such thing as a bad picnic. <laughs> Bunk. I said, you're right, honey. There's no such thing as a bad picnic. She brought me out of my space. It was inspiring. I still tell her about that. She remembers it. But she said, yeah, we had a great, ticket, great picnic. She doesn't remember that I was harried because she didn't see it. She was inspiring. But mentors are often older than us. And in order to define that, I have to define old age. Old age is 25 years older than you are today. <laughs> you remind, when you were 10, what was old age, 25 or 30? Uh, Vanessa was teaching at a, a camp in Madison Camp Shalom, and she was teaching these little five-year-olds, and they wanted to know yet if she was double digits. <laughs> Some of you here are near to three triple digits, but you know, they wanted to know if she was double digits. So when you're 50, old age is 75, right? 25, old age is 50. Uh, and I had this a little old guy, I spoke in the Madison Senior Center, and this little old guy came up to me and he said to me the other day, Dr. Pastor, how old do you think I am? <laughs> I have learned never to answer that question. <laughs> I said, 60. I knew he wasn't 60. He said, I'm 102. I said, wow, you don't look a day over 80. <laughs> and, uh, you don't look a day over 80. You're one of those spry 80-year-olds. And, and I said to him, I said, pardon me, sir, what is old age to you? And he looked up and he smiled and he said, 103. <laughs> so there are exceptions to this rule. But if you take people that are 25 years older than you, <clears throat> who are your mentors? who are showing you the way, who are doing a good job, you know them, you've read about them, or they're in your memory, you come into contact with them, or they're friends of friends, they tend to have three qualities. Number one, they're lifelong learners. <clears throat> they learn things. They're not afraid to learn things. They're not afraid to get on email. They're not afraid to learn something on a computer. They're not afraid to learn a new recipe. They're not afraid to learn something. Learning is critical. Throughout the life space, until you drop dead, that's number one. Number two, they're actively involved in life. Actively involved in life. Very good study that came out of the British Medical Journal looked at three groups of people. Group number one were couch potatoes. They're not you. They're people who stay at home and sit on the couch. And what do they do? They watch television day after day after day after day after day. It's the same TV. 
I mean, we've got new cable, and we've got now 250 channels of junk. We used to have only 50 channels of junk, and we used to have four channels of junk. So those are the couch potatoes. Group number two, actively involved athletes in an athletic way. They go out to the gym, they exercise every day, and they want to talk you into it too, the, 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 uh, the exercise people. Group number three, actively involved in a non-athletic way. They define that as going to movies, going to shows, getting together with other people, and Indian casinos. Nice. Oh, Chuck, Indian casinos. You would say that actively involved, right? In a non-athletic way. Fit the definition. Followed these people for five years, and what they found was the couch potatoes died two years sooner than the gym rats. These were seniors 75 and older. Couch potatoes died two years sooner than the gym rats. But there was no difference between those who were actively involved in a non-athletic way and the people who exercised. Now, I am not recommending that this activity <laughs> and we have become so lazy that it's this activity. You just have to <laughs> and soon they'll put electrodes in here and move our eyes back and forth. Clunk, 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 clunk. This activity is equal to this activity. Not at all. Because exercise gives us lots and lots of goodness that make us feel better. But it's the active involvement that's important that a mentor does. So it's lifelong learning, actively involved, and hopefulness. Now, what is hopefulness? Hopefulness is a little bit stronger than optimism. Optimism is extremely important, but sometimes it has a Pollyanna attitude to it. Everything's going to turn out for the best. Well, I hate to tell you, but you know, everything doesn't always turn out for the best. Hopefulness is knowing there are obstacles, there are pitfalls, there are problems. I may have to change the goal that I have, but if I fall down, I'm going to pick myself up, dust myself up, and start all over again. That is hopefulness. It is a much, much stronger issue than optimism. So that's what your mentors have. So in order to reach what I call your long, sweet life, it's not just the balance of physical, mental, family, and social, spiritual, material, but it's finding your mentor who will help you find your path. But I caution you, attention. Great is the problem of life and death. Time passes swiftly by and opportunity is lost. Each of us should strive to awaken. Awaken. Take heed. Do not squander your life. Thank you very much. And